Since childhood, so many of us have wondered at it, wrapped up nightly in the old, star-eaten blanket of the sky. That feeling as if you could watch the heavens forever, especially during the period before your parents finally bought a color telly in 1986. <laughs> it's often said that somewhere out there in the universe, <laughs> that infinity of violent cold seemingly without creation or culture, if you will, that great astral Aberdeen. <laughs> Out there may be many other worlds like ours, only even better because they've got seven-foot-high blue aliens. <laughs> Is it any wonder that the unfashionably eccentric, the lonely, the unsightly, we science fiction fans generally, in fact, <laughs> never cease hoping and looking that we still remain entranced by the possibility of reaching other worlds, of discovering or even building a utopia or at the very least a branch of Games Workshop, out there, <laughs> out there in space. But how to get there? To find out, please welcome Helen Keane with It Is Rocket Science. Thank you. In this series, we'll be taking a low-budget, highly subjective look at the history and future of space travel. A long-term passion of mine, which some people have described as geeky, others nerdy, although I prefer the term really unusually highly intelligent. <laughs> the frailties of the human condition and our tiny BBC budget mean we are unable to employ the narrating talents of Dr. Carl Sagan. The cosmos. 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 Universe. Cosmos. 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 The cosmos. Cosmos. In space and time. <laughs> Sir Patrick Moore. <laughs> Or Professor Brian Cox. <laughs> so, helping me tonight will be a sophisticated electronic synthesis of all three and then some. With the astonishing computing power of a pocket calculator tied to a Sinclair ZX Spectrum, I built him myself. Please welcome the voice of space. Hello. <laughs> Many things can ignite an interest in rockets. As we'll see during the 1940s, for the Nazis, it was the prospect of a comprehensive aerial bombardment of London with the V-2 rocket superweapon. And during the 1980s, for me, it was the prospect of a coach tour of Germany with National Express and my parents. <laughs> As for a whole fortnight, we bossed through the jewels of the Rhineland in the slowest, most unfashionable form of mechanical transportation. I imagined rocketing on the fastest and coolest Though what coach travel and space travel do have in common is, when they hear you've done either, people always ask, Ooh, but how did you go to the toilet? <laughs> Humanity's greatest minds have wondered at exploring the origins of the universe and our place within it. For some, their legacy lives on in the wonderful machines named after them. Looking outwards and giving his name to the Hubble Space Telescope was, of course, American astronomer Edwin Hubble. And looking inwards and giving his name to the Swiss wonder machine, the Large Hadron Collider, England's own Eddie Large. Hey, Sid, have you seen that Higgs boson anywhere? <laughs> but for others, a more obscure fate awaited. In this episode, we will remember the three fathers of modern rocket science. Geniuses who, when they suggested rocket travel, all met with the same response. <laughs> Laughter. <laughs> And tonight, we certainly aim to redress that. In the second half of the 19th century, in Russia, America and Transylvania, lived three small boys. Each of them was obsessed with a book by Jules Verne, one of the few popular science fiction books around at the time called... From the Earth to the Moon. Even if you haven't read it, you can probably work out what happens. <laughs> I, too, loved science fiction as a teenager, but mostly because I found some sci-fi books with rude bits in them. Quiver, puny human, as I explore your primitive Earth torso with my scaly tentacles. <laughs> but, you know, in an erotic way. Sorry, I seem to have got one of my thick tongues caught in your cardigan. <laughs> Three boys grew up with arguably loftier ambitions than copping off with lizard men. The first and oldest was a Russian, born in 1857. My name is Konstantin Edvardovich Tsiolkovsky. I am a self-taught scientist. After my death, in recognition of my longing to see new worlds, a crater on the dark side of the moon was named after me. Also, a starship on Star Trek The Next Generation. <laughs> But just over a hundred years ago, I drew the first pictures of orbiting space stations and colonies on Mars that I dreamed of building. In a country that seemed timeless, unchanging, 
He imagined humanity's future in space in such astounding detail. We will travel far in rockets. Our faces will feel the warmth of new alien suns, and our eyes will see the birth of new alien races as they burst through our chests and chase Sigourney Weaver all over the shop. <laughs> Tchaikovsky's ideas were pretty much ignored during his lifetime, wrongly, because he's one of the most astonishing visionaries the world has ever seen. In 1903, in America, the Wright brothers are making the first tentative flight in the first aeroplane. But in Russia, Tchaikovsky was living in a log cabin with no electricity, about 100 miles outside Moscow, calculating that the horizontal speed required for a minimal orbit around the Earth is five miles per second, and that this could be achieved by a means of a multi-stage rocket, one that comes apart the higher up it gets, powered not by gunpowder like all previous rockets had been, but by liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. In 1903. And people say David Bowie was ahead of his time. One of the great men of the universe. <laughs> Out of interest, where did you learn to pronounce universe? University. <laughs> Tsiolkovsky didn't make things. His work was largely theoretical. But the next father of rocket science was an American named Robert H. Goddard. And he built stuff, like the first ever liquid fueled rocket. So in a practical sense, Tsiolkovsky was waiting for Goddard. <laughs> an English degree not wasted, thank you very much. It is America, 1926, and I am Robert H. Goddard. So, of course, now the American people are in love with space, but things were very different back in the 1920s. The New York Times publishes an editorial rubbishing Goddard's ideas, even his knowledge of physics. They didn't publish a retraction until the day after Apollo 11 left for the moon. My country is laughing at me, but I shall not desist. I will move to a lonely region, New Mexico, and continue my research. Why? Here's a suitable town in the middle of nowhere. I shall perfect my rocket legacy for all time in Roswell. <laughs> the Roswell alien crash landing has really got to be the biggest final insult, hasn't it? Robert H. Goddard says, Using science and facts, I can prove that we can travel to the moon. And everyone goes, I don't think so, moon man. Then, a few years later, in the very place he goes to to get away from being ridiculed, someone else says, Little green men in a flying saucer have landed in Roswell and the government have covered it up. And everyone goes... Mm, yeah, no, I, I believe that. That sounds completely plausible. <laughs> there are two museums in Roswell. One is to the alien crash landing, and it's full of people dressed as little green men. The other one, Robert H. Goddard's museum, covered in dust. No one ever goes there. Perhaps, fortunately, Goddard died just before the Roswell alien landing, but when he did die, no one made a film of his autopsy starring Ant and Dick. <laughs> Rockets don't capture the popular imagination, but that all changes with the third father of modern rocketry. His name is Hermann Oberth, and he is a Transylvanian German. And just a teeny bit very right-wing. <laughs> but who isn't in these days of 1930s Germany? Commies! That's who? I hate them! Even as a small boy, Oberth is obsessed with rockets. They're all he thinks about. Yeah, I, I draw them in my school books. Oi, Oberth, what if I told you about making mucky drawings in your maths book? It's a rocket fraulein. That is the shaft of the rocket, and those two things at the sides are, are, the, are the fins. Really? And what's spreading out of the top of the rocket? Satellites? <laughs> Yes, rockets were all he cared about, and Oberth slaved for years, perfecting his PhD about space travel before taking it to the university panel. But one by one, they ridiculed his ideas. Rockets in space? Pah! This is a utopian fairy story. Even the most revered senior professor, her doctor emeritus professor of the chair of engineering thing, scorned him. Uh, but in space... Uh... How would you go to the toilet? <laughs> Finally, Oberth turned to the only sympathetic pair of eyes in the room. Cheryl Cole? <laughs> I'm afraid I'm a no-pet. <laughs> Oberth's dreams are in tatters. I see from your callous reaction there <laughs> that you have never drunk the bitter draught of academic rejection well I have I can tell you right and there's a parallel because I was always very good at school um, top of my class I went to a very good university and when I took my finals I was predicted a first yeah when I went to get the results didn't turn out to be a first but it did turn out to be an odd number <laughs> so what does Herman Oberth do? well I'll tell you what he doesn't do, right? What Herman Oberth doesn't do is spend the next five years in a succession of increasingly dispiriting local authority temp jobs that pay under 6 75 an hour. 
When everyone's told him that rocket travel will never happen, Herman O'Berth does something extraordinary, something that brings the world to the very brink of destruction. He publishes his PhD thesis himself. Anyone can be the author. It says so in the back of the mail on Sunday. <laughs> I know, I know, Radio 4. Don't even get me started on how left-wing the mail is. <laughs> to everyone's amazement, Oberth's book becomes an overnight bestseller. It's reprinted, it sells out, it's reprinted again. What are you reading, Helga? It is Oberth's masterpiece explaining the physics of the space rocket. See? Here is the shaft of the rocket. <laughs> and here are the fins. Rocket clubs spring up all over Germany and then all over Europe. Rockets really start taking off. Young people rush to join them, and it's the 1920s, so it's flapper girls and young men with monocles, full of hope, full of optimism. They greet each other by saying, onwards to Mars. Onwards to Mars. I imagine they are a little bit geeky. <laughs> and I'd almost like to leave the story there, where Oberth is a bit of a J.K. Rowling literary phenomenon. But the thing about rockets, particularly the first rockets, is that getting them off the ground wasn't really that hard at all. But once you'd launched a rocket, it was incredibly difficult to control where it went. And Oberth's book is a bit like his early rockets. As the 1920s becomes the 1930s, the National Socialist Party begin to tighten their stranglehold on Germany. And the Nazis think to themselves, right, so if you can use a rocket to send a man to, say, the moon, couldn't you also use a rocket to send explosives to, say, London? I was talking about that at the Edinburgh Science Festival, and when I came to that bit, it got a really big laugh, and I thought, what are they planning, these Edinburgh scientists? <laughs> The Nazis spend a huge amount of time and money and use slave labour from concentration camps to develop the V2 vengeance weapon. Of the three fathers of modern rocketry, only Oberth lived to see spaceflight become a reality. But at an horrendous cost, and not just during the war. Because it's after the war that the Soviets and the Americans come back into the story. They realise that these V2 rockets will be a brilliant way to deliver their new atomic bombs to each other. But, you know, not in a nice way. <laughs> the race to the moon was essentially a side effect of another race. A race to see who would create the biggest and most powerful rockets. Rockets capable of carrying warheads that could destroy the world many times over. And they also named the class of spaceship after me on the Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, hello, have you not been listening? <laughs> I'm like a bit of a total Nazi, yeah? <laughs> but next, the USS Space... Is Hitler? <laughs> Don't laugh at that! <laughs> but it's the hold that space has on the imagination that prompted the incredible technological advances of the 20th century. The fathers of rocket science were men who followed their dreams in the face of poverty, professional indifference, public derision. Dreams of extraordinary travel. Dreams of other worlds, of new friends welcoming us into their many, many arms. Uh, oh. Uh, oh. Uh, 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 sorry. Tsiolkovsky saw rocket travel as the trajectory to human immortality. In 1895, he said, The final part of mankind will, in all likelihood, never perish. They will migrate from sun to sun as they go out. And so, there is no end to life, to intellect, and the perfection of humanity. Its progress is everlasting. Thank you very much for listening, and... Onwards! Onwards, Onwards to, to Mars. Mars! It is Rocket Science, starred Helen Keane, Peter Serafinowicz and Susie Kay. It was written by Miriam Underhill and Helen Keane. The producer was Gareth Edwards.